So you're all very, very welcome. Thank you for coming along to Get Started, which is our seminar on entrepreneurship. And one of the things you'll notice with the lineup of speakers that we have today is some are serial entrepreneurs, some have worked with um, entrepreneurs, and others are entrepreneurs, and they get started every day, because that journey does not end in the first two years. Um, so when to start up, not a startup. Um, when are we going to get started? We're going to get started right now. I am going to introduce our very first speaker to the stage, who is Anya Kerr. Um, co-founder and COO of Neva Labs, a former DCU graduate, so you should give her a special round of applause. This is your future over here. Um, Anya is just, well, she's uh, with Neva Labs now, and as part of that has worked in as a journalist. She's worked with Storyful, she's worked with Facebook, and I am going to let her tell you more about all of that and what she's working on right now. So exit me and uh, enjoy your afternoon. Oh, before I, one quick thing. Just want to say thank you to DCU Business School, Invent, Alpha and the Ryan Academy, because it's been a bit of a team effort pulling all of this together. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Joan. I'm putting my little timer here because brevity is not my strong point. Uh, so if you see me rushing back here now and again, so check my timer. Um, thank you so much for having me here today. Um, yeah, as Joan mentioned, I'm a former graduate of DCU, actually on two occasions. Um, and normally when I talk all over the world about my education background, I normally start with the story of how I did my Masters of Journalism here in DCU and from there everything took off. And what I leave out normally is the fact that I started my education actually down the road in St. Pat's. Uh, because growing up, I always wanted to be a teacher and a journalist, and I was really torn apart as a 15, 16 year old as to which to do. And my uncle who was in journalism gave me the really great advice at the time, which was go and do your education, Bachelor of Education degree, it's a holistic degree, and you'll have a specialism, you'll have knowledge that will sustain you throughout everything you ever put your mind to. And I can genuinely say throughout my career, there's never been a day I've regretted doing my Bachelor of Education, doing two years as a teacher, and from there saying, okay, the time is now uh, to go into journalism. And I was really fortunate, I did my Masters of Journalism here in DCU, and if any of you have done the degree or Masters here, at the end of it, you have this wonderful opportunity to do a placement. And my placement was in the Irish Independent, and I was incredibly fortunate uh, to have actually gotten poached by the Irish Times at the end of my placement. I uh, spent a year and a half with the Irish Times, went on to the Irish Examiner as a political reporter, and then came back to the Irish Independent for three and a half years, based out of uh, Leinster House, um, where all of you will probably remember the boom to bust. I lived that for many years out of Leinster House. But after seven years of traditional journalism, I definitely grew frustrated uh, with just the modes of distribution, feeling like all the time we were a little bit lagging behind how the online conversation and community was developing. And I was very fortunate uh, when I was in the Irish Independent, then uh, Hillary Clinton's State Department had uh, a programme where seven journalists from the north of Ireland and seven from the Republic were chosen to go over to Boston and New York for two weeks. And we got to meet the best and brightest in the industry. We met Marty Barron then in the Boston Globe, into Jay Rosen in New York University. We were in the New York Times, ProPublica. I saw it all in two weeks. And at the end of the two weeks, I was sitting in a diner with the other 13 journalists. And up on the ticker in Times Square came the announcement that the IMF had arrived in Ireland. And at the time, we kind of had an informal rule in the newsroom that we weren't to tweet anything that could compromise tomorrow's newspaper. And I remember just this real moment of frustration, but also realizing the conversation is happening in different places. It's not about a pointed viewing with your newspaper or your TV channel at night. And when I got on the plane the next day back to Ireland, I emailed Mark Little. I had never met him before. I watched him on TV throughout my childhood and said, I am ready to give up seven years of being a senior political correspondent and journalist to go and rethink how we do journalism. And joined Storyful, spent an incredible five years there, back to a room of, you go one week from sparring with Vincent Brown almost on a weekly basis on TV, to then being in a room with 10 people trying to figure out the future of journalism. And 
Yes, it's terrifying, but I've always kind of tried to set myself a goal that life truly does begin at the end of your comfort zone. And thankfully for us in Storyful, if any of you know our story, we were the first social media news agency in the world, grew from a very small team. Today, Storyful is a team of about 200 people. We were acquired by News Corporation. They saw that the ability to match technology with expert journalism meant that you could use social platforms to find quality eyewitness content, user-generated content, and turn that into stories uh, for the world's media. At the end of the five years in Storyful, I figured, right, time for another leap. I've gone from teaching to journalism, traditional media into startup, what's next? And I took another interesting uh, tour of journalism when I went to Facebook uh, two years ago. Moved myself to New York, uh, friends and family and husband behind, because I figured if ever there was a moment and an opportunity to play a role in the future of journalism, this is it inside the biggest platform in the world with two billion people as its users, as its community. So for almost two years, I worked out in New York leading journalism partnerships uh, for Facebook and basically working with the world's newsrooms every day to think about how can you find content on the platform, how can you build audiences on the platform and how can you monetize? How can you build sustainable journalism through a platform like Facebook? As you can probably imagine, the big fake news um, issue took over my life uh, for the last year and that's where my education background really came into play, was to think about not only the supply of content, news information, but the demand for it. How do you help people seek out quality information? How do you give them the skills and tools they need to be discerning users of media and to think about concepts like news literacy? And after two years in Facebook, helped to set up the Facebook Journalism Project, helped to set up the News Integrity Initiative, did a lot of really meaningful work in Facebook. I always had it in the back of my mind that if an opportunity came to do something really special back in Ireland with Mark Little, I'd do it. Regardless of the risks and the scars of doing a startup back in Storyful. And so last month, came back to Dublin. I'm six weeks into the start of yet another venture. I'm thinking about all of the fundraising and building an MVP and all of the excitement and challenges that come with a startup. So for the next 15 minutes, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the thinking around Neva Labs. Uh, I don't think we'll have maybe time for questions today, but I am going to leave an email at the end and you have my Twitter handle, it's just all you care. Anyone who has questions, feedback, would love to get involved or some of the concepts resonate today, please reach out because I'd love to get your thinking on it. And so, as I think about the last 10, 15, 20 years in media and how we're all consuming content, news and information, there's been a no number of revolutions, namely three, as I kind of see how they relate to the work that I've been doing. And one is just that means of production. Like once upon a time, I as a journalist used to simply think about my audience every day. Who was going to buy my newspaper? Who was going to listen to me on RT? And it was a one-way broadcast medium. Except today, the audience, you guys, are also publishers. You're eyewitnesses, you're uploading videos, you're writing stories, you've got images, you're doing Q&As, you're doing polls. Everyone is now a publisher. And when everyone is a publisher, well, how do you find the content that's meaningful? How do you find the content that's going to be turned into news? And that's one that the media industry has had to really grapple with, is that you have this huge amount of content, more than ever, but only a fraction of it is actually valuable. And so there's been that competition between journalists and what you might have called some years ago citizen journalists and trying to find meaning in it. The other revolution, as I have seen it, has been the means of consumption. Very few of us, I bet, go out to Super Value in the morning into Spa and buy the hard copy of the Irish Times or Independent, the Star, the Daily Mail, whatever your preferred newspaper is. But I bet you're consuming it on Snapchat, or through Facebook or through Twitter. So your means of consumption is changing and it's through devices like this. It's not through your big hard copy newspaper. You're consuming podcasts, you're listening to playbacks, uh, lots of different modes. And for the industry, this is the one that's been probably most painful. You know, decades ago, the industry owned the means of distribution. They owned the printing presses, 
they own the appointed viewing. I'm sure we can all remember a time where, you know, you had your dinner in the evening around the six o'clock news or the nine o'clock news was put on every night, maybe before going to bed. There was appointed viewing times. You don't have that as much now because the modes of how content is distributed has totally changed. All of which means we're in this massive moment of information overload. Everyone is now a publisher. You've got more content than ever, more platforms than ever, more means to distribute content. But for us, the consumers, the users, the public, the community, that can feel really overwhelming. And it has also meant that we've seen this trust gap emerge. And I'm sure all of you have, have seen some of the statistics, especially in the United States, Trust in media is at an historic low at the moment, and it follows breakdown in trust in other institutions like politics, like the law, and others. So we're grappling with this huge moment around the collapse of trust, and this statistic around just one in four people uh, trusting social media to do a good job sorting fact from fiction, that comes from a Reuters Institute report. If any of you are interested in this sort of thing, have a look back at this beginning of the year, is an incredible report. You're going to see me cite a couple of things from them throughout this. The other consequence of those three revolutions is that if something is free, it often means you are the product. And so if something is free, you're often having to consume really irritating ads or those cookies. We've all had to accept them. And then you see the same advertisement following you all around the internet. It might have been a bag that you're going to treat yourself to or that Ryanair flight and it just keeps following you around for weeks and months, all because you got something, a free piece of content, a free website, a free app. And what, what I'm thinking right now is that actually the price of free is too expensive. It's too irritating. And as a result, we're seeing some changes in behavior. Now that's all been a little bit doom and gloom so far, but there is a but. This is the but and this I'm hoping is the ray of hope for someone like me who desperately cares in journalism and the power of journalism to inform society and to create this idea of informed communities. And within informed communities, we have stronger democracies and stronger societies. So I'm hoping and thinking, and I believe, or else I'm in trouble after six weeks at Neva Labs, that there is a correction coming and that there are some patterns that we should all watch for. And this is one, is that I'm betting many of you are paying for Spotify, or you're paying for Netflix, or you're paying for something that is just making your consumption of music or movies a little smoother, a little easier, a little bit more compact, and that you're doing it because you're fed up scrolling. And we've all gotten into this habit of scroll, scroll, scroll on our phones, mindless scrolling. And I saw a statistic recently that for some of us, we do so much of that movement on our phone every day that we actually climb the height of the Eiffel Tower. But what is happening, and this is back to the Reuters report, is that with millennials in the US, between 18 and 24, there's been a massive jump in just one year in those prepared to pay for news. Look at that, 8% in 2016 to 18% in 2017, prepared to pay for, net, for content through news providers, New York Times, Washington Post and others. And these are the Netflix generation. These are the Spotify generation. There's a shift happening. They're fed up with ads, fed up with the cookies, fed up with this poor experience. And they want something that feels personal to them. So is there not a revolution coming? And my bet with Mark Little in setting up Neva Labs is that people want to take back control. And when we talk about control, we're, I'm thinking there about algorithms. You know when you've gone onto a platform or an app and it's suggesting content and you're going, how does it know me so well? You know, what has this learned about me that it's able to serve up that advertisement or that piece of content? Because of the algorithms in the background, because of data that provider has on you. And so we think there's a correction coming where people feel, hold on a minute, I don't know how that algorithm is working. I don't know how that's tracking me. I don't know why that advertisement is following me around the internet. And so you'll see here, this Attention Merchants book, highly recommend it for any of you interested in user behaviors. When audiences begin to believe that they are being ill-used, that you are the product, and you so badly treat them, a correction is going to come. 
And so some, these are some of the patterns I've been obsessing with for the last six weeks. When you look at it, one in 10 of the world's internet population now blocks ads. And I'm betting, and I'm not gonna do it, but I'm betting if I ask people to do a show of hands, how many of you had ad blockers, it would be quite high. It's part of our daily routines. We've had enough. A lot of people are just installing ad blockers not to deal with the irritation. 86% of Americans have removed or masked their digital footprints. They've said, I don't want this platform or this provider tracking me across the website, gathering data on me to sell me something. Enough. And the third thing we've seen as a pattern is this move to mindfulness. That less is more. How can I get better at my health and my fitness? And you'll see there's a huge explosion happening with these apps. 1.7 billion spent on mobile health, fitness, mindfulness apps. And so that has begged the question for me. I use, uh, you know, my running uh, map. I use the Under Armour, uh, my fitness pal. I use the meditation apps. I've started to become a big consumer of these as an escape from just the saturation all the time of information and notifications. What would it look like if we took the same type of approach to fitness, to health, to meditation, to news and information, the stuff that actually informs us and makes us better citizens and helps us make more informed decisions? What would that look like? And that's what we've been grappling with for the last couple of weeks. And one of the st stats that we kept coming back to is this Annie app. For those of you who love insights and analytics, have a look at these guys. They're based out in Silicon Valley. They come up with great analytics. And this one has been particularly revealing for us, is that the apps that we love are the apps that we spend the least amount of time with. And those apps are things like Calm, Google Calendar, Headspace, Insight Timer, My Fitness Pal, Audible. Things that are helping us with mindfulness, being organized, but we come for very short bursts of time and we leave happy. The apps that we spend the longest amount of time with are the ones we're actually unhappiest with. And you can see them yourself. I'm not going to list them all out. Um, but you've got Facebook, WeChat, Reddit, Tweetbot, Weibo, Tinder, Grindr, et cetera, et cetera. You get the picture. So there's something happening in that less is more. This is not about coming in for hours and hours of your time, but instead coming in short bursts of engagement, getting what you need and leaving. So having spent so many years in the industry, and I'm sure you all know this instinctively now, that when you go to a website or an app or a platform, they want you to stay as long as possible because the longer you are there, the more advertising you will consume. The industry, when it comes to media, is run on advertising, and that's nobody's fault. That's how the model has evolved. But it's a model that is on very, very shaky ground at the moment, and this model of engagement is not sustainable. So our bet is this concept called time well spent. It's not about the length of time you're coming in for, how many articles you're reading, what your engagement is like. It might be better that you only come in for 10 minutes, none of this mindless scrolling, the Eiffel Tower, and instead come in for 10 minutes and leave with the content and information that's relevant to you. So that's why with all of those revolutions and all of those assumptions, Six weeks ago, Mark Little and I announced the start of a new venture, and we're calling it Neva Labs for now. Won't be what the first product will be called. It's just giving us some flexibility to be experimental, to try different things, to innovate. We're a team of journalists, researchers, developers, who are thinking about this concept of what does it look like if people take back personal control of their news experience, that there's greater transparency, relevance, and value, and that you can proactively improve the quality of your social experience and news experience. So what might it look like? One of our assumptions right now is it'll probably start as an app. And we're thinking about three simple concepts that you come in, we try to understand what your diet is like. What is your news and social and information diet like? Are you very heavily weighted to only reading content that is Irish based? Are you following just a lot of male voices are there just a lot of noisy people on your Twitter streams and on your Facebook streams who are just drowning everyone else out? What is, this, what is the stuff you really care about? So trying to kind of help you with a social graph, with a diagnostic that helps you understand this is what your diet looks like. 
and then saying to you, here's where you can go to. You can set some goals. We're going to give you the algorithm. You're going to own that. You're going to own the filters. If you decide you want to dial up on diversity, gender diversity, geo diversity, diversity of voices, diversity of perspectives, we're going to put that in your hands. You control it. And we're going to challenge you sometimes with new perspectives and new ideas so you're not just stuck in your, your filter bubble. And that you are ultimately going to control this experience. So this is the thing that we're hoping is going to differentiate. This idea of something, someone having your back. This app being your personal assistant when it comes to news and information. Every day, just like a health and fitness app where you come in and set goals around carbs and protein or goals around meditation, that you're going to set yourself goals when it comes to being informed and engaged and having trustworthy, authentic content and information. A personal assistant for people who want to take conscious control of their news experience and make it more relevant, transparent, and empowering. So, so these are some of the big principles we're thinking about. I'm going to have a real quick check on my time. Oh, I'm out, but I'll, I'll go through these real quick. And there is my bell. Uh, so these are some of our, our principles that we're thinking about. Some of them are, as you're going to see, very different to how the industry has traditionally thought about news and information, knowledge and content. That this is about maximum return on your attention, the end of that mindless scroll, news that's going to challenge you. This isn't about just putting you back into your filter bubbles and confirming your own biases. Can we instead so show you some new ideas and perspectives and opinions and analyses so that it does surprise you and inform you? No hidden filters, you own the filters. And we're going to probably call the filters something so you can see with each filter, dial it up, dial it down, you control it. Trust, true transparency, and no agenda but yours. If we do this right, this isn't about the agenda of advertisers. The agenda is yours and yours alone. However, there are going to be some known unknowns, particularly having come from a platform like Facebook, set out to be a network for friends and family, very good intentions. It never set out to become the world's biggest distributor as well of news and information for the industry to be so reliant on it for engagement and traffic. So what are some of the known unknowns we have to think about? Well, the thing I'm obsessed with as a known unknown is when you think of personalization, you often think of the paradox. If you are getting more localized, personalized content, does that not mean you're being pushed further into your filter bubble? So you're not actually worsening polarization. And what I'm betting on is no, that actually through personalization we can solve for polarization. Because if we can build something that you trust and you develop your goals and filters and, and are in, in control of the algorithm, you're going to be open to those different perspectives, analyses, opinions, and having a more rounded view of the world. And so we've been doing a lot of different experiments. It turns out I have a pretty healthy social media diet, turns out. I'm pretty kind of uh, Goldilocks. I'm even on, on uh, little bits of everything. Mark, however, turns out has been tweeting way too much about Trump. So he's been overcompensating on that. And he had no idea until we did this very simple, it took us a couple of minutes to do this diagnostic, what he has been tweeting most about. The question then became about, well, is actually that what his community care about? Do they really want Mark to be tweeting about Trump all the time? So these are the things that we deeply care about. And we know there's some unknowns that we're going to have to really stress test, like data privacy as well. How can we ensure that we have the back of the user on that? Very finally, I'm sure all of you think sometimes about what will success look like? What is the outcome? What are our metrics? This is our one, is return on attention, ROA. So ours isn't going to be about advertising dollars. Ours isn't going to be about how long can we keep you in our app. Ours is going to be about you coming, getting what you need, leaving, return on attention. Very quickly, and I won't go through all of this, I was thinking a lot about students such as ourselves who might be going off on a new project, a new challenge, hopefully thinking about a startup. And for me, over the last six weeks, these are some of the things I keep coming back to. If anyone wants to follow up with me afterwards, DM me on Twitter or email me uh, at anya at neva-labs.com, and I'll put up another slide in a second. These are some of the concepts I use all the time to try and break down really complex things. So I always start with building a snowman. I have my challenge. What is it I'm trying to do? I try to keep that to two sentences. With my snowman, the head of it is, what is the vision? Trying to kind of articulate that in one or two sentences. 
Your strategy should be six or seven core things that you're trying to do, and then the bottom of the snowman are your tactics. What are the things you're going to do to execute on the body of the snowman, the strategy? So if you think about it like that, it can break it down for you. This one I come back to time and time again, from and to. It's really simple, whether it's the user, where you want to bring them from and to, or maybe you're going in to a company that needs to totally revitalize itself. Where is it now? Where are you trying to bring it to? It sounds so simple, but when you draw a line down through a page and write from and to on either side of it, honestly, trust me, you do it. It is like therapy. Um, design do, this is just a mantra we have in our MVP team. We're only five, six people. Design it, do it. Just go and test it quickly. Do it cheaply, but do it and repeat. And where you have to pivot, do it quickly. Go back to the drawing board. Assumptions and knowledge, I tend to kind of list out, oh, what are all the assumptions I have? And I grade them one uh, to four. And you'll see here the different gradings I put them on them. Don't just ever leave it there. Come back to it next month and force yourself to see, did one go to a two? Did four go back to a two? Are your assumptions actually getting worse the more you go on or are they getting better? And then the last one I want to quickly show you, which is the one I have to come in and face every day is my S curve which is thinking about, are we near the end of the beginning or the beginning of the end? <laughs> and I have until February to try and build a small prototype and try and prove concept and some of the things I've talked about today. And for any of you, again, thinking about a challenge or a project or an assignment, think about this as well. What is the criteria that you need to get you to the end of the beginning? Because if you can get there, that steeper part of the curve is much easier and you just keep building yourself milestones as you go. Those are just some things I'm hoping might be helpful for those of you starting out because DCU was brilliant in giving me a lot of tools and tips. I'm hoping there might be something there to help all of you as you're thinking about careers beyond DCU. And just finally, this is our uh, Twitter handle for those of you who want to follow. Any of you interested in being part of a test or just interested in updates, you can sign up for a newsletter uh, on our website. It's just news, news, nevalabshq.com. Uh, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter, my email, Anya at neva-labs.com. And thank you, and sorry for going over time. Thank you so much for your attention. I hopefully will get to meet some of you uh, in the weeks and months and years to come. Thank you so much.